hi everybody. Thanks, Rob. Um, I'm Sonnet Takahisa. And as I said in the chat, for another uh, six weeks and counting, um, I am the Director of Education at the Brooklyn Historical Society. Um, and we'll tell you a little bit about a project that we're wrapping up. I've been involved in museums, museum education, um, and actually started a New York City public school um, where one of our other speakers, just by happenstance, Dr. Habiba Noor, was one of our teachers. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about a project. So I am joined on this presentation with Habiba Noor, who is um, an adjunct professor at Trinity College in San Antonio. And our other uh, team member is Aunt Alex Trenalone, who for the next six weeks um, is at the Brooklyn Historical Society. He's the uh, manager of teaching and learning and managed and the whole project um, that we're going to talk about today. So Alex is going to do most of the driving. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of an introduction and then we're going to try and get you involved in really listening um, in some of the materials that we have. Some of you may have been with us um, on the last session. I'm not sure if I, I think I have a better sense now than I did then. So if you were um, with us, welcome back. Um, otherwise, we'll tell you a little bit about Brooklyn Historical Society and about this website that we've created and then get you working on it um, as we uh, uh, give you a chance to play around a little bit. So, Alex, do you want to just uh, tee up Brooklyn yeah. Historical Society web? Um, Brooklyn Historical Society is located um, in downtown Brooklyn and Brooklyn Heights. The mission is to make the vibrant history of Brooklyn tangible, meaningful, and, excuse me, relevant to the people of today. Um, it was founded in 1863, which at that time was a time of great change when Brooklyn was, had shifted from a sort of agricultural backwater uh, to become the third largest city in the country. And the prominent founders uh, at the time felt that it would be important to document the history of Brooklyn. Um, but more expansively, all the cities, towns, and villages of Long Island, of which Brooklyn is and is and was a part, uh, but also to document the history of America and to document the history of New York. Um, the building that you're getting little bits and pieces of uh, opened in the late uh, 1800s as a library and a society. And if we fast forward a bit um, to a time that the place started to think more uh, about audience, um, in the 1980s, Brooklyn Historical Society changed its name to be about Brooklyn, reestablished itself as a museum and an education center where we offered, as you can see, different kinds of exhibitions, programs with young people, um, and we'll talk a lot more today about the very pioneering oral history project and oral history collection um, that Brooklyn Historical Society established. The oral history collections really focus on reaching out to the unchronicled communities um, that are a part of Brooklyn. Um, it's about capturing experiences and adding to the breadth of the historical archive. Alex is showing you some of the range of our collections. You can see AIDS um, activists. We have things from Crossing Borders, Bridging Cultures. My very long oral history um, is in there. I offered it to the society. It's okay, Alex. Um, but there are also collections about uh, the relationships in Crown Heights in Brooklyn in the 1990s between Blacks and Jews. There are collections uh, where the oral histories are in Chinese from the newest Americans uh, collection in Chinatown, Sunset Park. There are collections in Spanish. Um, and today uh, we're gonna talk about the Muslims in Brooklyn collection. Um, the most recent collection, it's a three year project um, and incorporates about 50 plus oral histories uh, really designed as a way to address a huge gap in Brooklyn Historical Society's archives. Uh, our oral historian, Zahir Ali, who we saw a little smidgen of before, uh, really worked with community partners 
to identify a range of people in different neighborhoods, different ages, um, different generations, different walks of life to really give a sense of the representative diversity of Brooklyn's Muslim communities and the Muslims who have been in Brooklyn. These are all long form oral histories. They're two to three hours long, each one, each individual one. Um, they're meant to reinforce the fact that Muslims and Muslim communities have been a part of American life since before the nation's founding. Um, they're meant to reinforce the fact that Muslims have been a part of Brooklyn's history and that Brooklyn has been a part of the lives of many American Muslims and American Muslim groups. And I think you will see most definitely as we give you a sense today that Muslims are a very diverse group of people uh, throughout the world and in Brooklyn. Our goal today is to introduce uh, the website that we've been working on for the last year and a half, two years. I say we, more Alex and Habiba, because uh, I came on late to this project. Um, the website is really a way to offer um, uh, access into this amazing collection. It provides a variety of ways to get to know the narrators who so generously contributed their stories to our oral history collection. Um, I think today we really want to, more than anything, we've talked a lot throughout this conference about storytelling um, and the importance of the empathy that gets generated as people tell their stories and people respect others telling their stories. Today, I think we're going to focus a lot on the power of listening to stories and what it means to hear other people's stories. Um, this website is not a primer on Islam, um, nor is it even a history of Muslims in America. Um, it's a set of lessons. It's a set of uh, web portals that give you a different way of sort of understanding a range of different aspects of life um, in Brooklyn's Muslims communities, um, and in fact, in Brooklyn itself. Um, this is also not a set of lessons um, that we have created in the teacher toolbox that are designed to be used in conjunction with a specific day of the year or a particular holiday. Um, we want you today to understand the power of listening. Um, you will see that this website is filled with clips um, that recognize that people's stories are things that can resonate with our own lives, whether we are Muslim or non-Muslim, um, that this is about different ways of being a human being, and that these stories then reference the fact that we have many different ways of connecting um, and the importance of sharing our stories. Um, all that said, in terms of what this is not, we have selected today clips, and we're going to focus on um, lessons that acknowledge that we are in the midst um, of the holy month of Ramadan. Um, Habib will talk a little bit about that. Um, and you'll get a little bit of a taste from some of the clips we've selected for you to listen to uh, about the different ways that people observe the holy month. Um, and today we'll also give you, just as we are doing now, a real um, taste, a little hint, a little teaser preview of what you'll find on the site once it's live. We're hoping to go live at the beginning of next month. Um, you can see Habir in the cap, Habir, Sahir, our oral historian uh, was in that shot. Uh, yeah, there's Zahir, uh, who was the oral historian who, who uh, spearheaded this project. So with that, I think I'm gonna turn the mic and the highlighted box over to Habiba Noor. Um, as I said, she's an adjunct professor. She was contracted by BHS to help develop the lessons um, that are presented on this curriculum. Um, and it's really been fun for me to reconnect with Habiba since we worked together at the New York City Museum School. God, over almost, no, it's more than a decade and a half ago. Wow, shows you how old I am. So Habiba, uh, take it away. Great. Hi, everyone. So 
when you get a chance to explore this website on your own, you'll see that there are multiple lessons and multiple themes. Um, for example, we have one on growing up and fitting in. We have one on migration. And as Sonnet said, this one is um, focused on holiday, the holiday, um, Ramadan and Eid. Um, and by the way, if, if there's, if I'm having, if you can't hear me, Alex or someone just let me know in the chat because I'm not sure how strong my internet is right now. It's kind of strange. Great. But I will just keep going. Um, so, so this, as Sonnet said, um, the purpose of the lesson and these oral histories is not Islam 101. Um, I think something that we know from, from good culturally relevant pedagogy is that you know, um, diverse communities are not necessarily an object to be studied, but rather we are um, a part of the broader fabric of, of this landscape. And when we think about themes like migration, we bring in lots of different stories of migration. And here in this particular story, in this particular set of, um, this particular Set of oral histories and lessons we're thinking about holidays and the broader theme of holidays and this is the, these oral histories tell us a bit about how muslims observe their holiday and um also as sonnet said there what what this what this oral history collection does is it kind of it, it forces us to think about sort of the lived experience of muslim people um, and that oftentimes the lived experience is not just a cookie cutter mold um, where everybody is just sort of following the rules in the exact same way. Um, I think an important theme to think about as we're listening to this, or these oral histories or, and, and generally these collections is that there is some unity in terms of how everyone is observing this practice and, and these holidays and then there's diversity. So I just want to give a little bit of background on, um, on the context of, of this particular theme, which is Eid and Ramadan. And I would say over the last 20 years, the whole idea of Ramadan has become more widely known and understood. Every year we, when you begin the month of Ramadan, there'll be some story in NPR or on CNN, or you, know, you hear these words a lot. So it's not something that is that foreign. And, and you know, in New York City, Ramadan is a school holiday, but in this country, it's, it's, it's a wide variety. <laughs> you know, some people might be very familiar with Ramadan, some people might have no idea. But just to give um, a basic primer, um, Ramadan is a month in the Islamic calendar, which, it la which is one lunar month, um, which is about 28 days. And during this um, lunar month, which does not coincide with the solar calendar, um, during these 28 days, Muslims are um, prescribed to fast um, from food and drink um, from sunup to sundown. Um, and this is something that is observed all over the world. Um, and um, it is very, it is extremely local to your particular place on this earth because the sun up, the sun rises and sets at different times for every location on this earth. So that's, um, so people start and stop based on their location. Um, but at the same time, there's, there is a unity of practice in terms of, you know, it's not like, oh, in, in India, they fast um, only this many hour, you know, like this in this particular way. And in, and in Senegal, they fast in another way. And in Brooklyn, they fast in another way. There is a unity of practice in that there is an, people abstain from food, from water, from smoking, from sexual activity, and they try to use this time to, for, you know, for, there are many different explanations as to why people fast. Um, but this is a, a sort of religious obligation. Now, does every single person fast? No. There are excuses, like, for example, um, for, for sickness, for age, children, you know, there are some children 
whose parents might not want them to fast, and there's some parents who might want their children to fast. So there's a huge, there's a wide variety. And also there's a variety in foods. Um, there isn't one Muslim cuisine because Islam is an incredibly diverse tradition. So there are some similarities, like you will hear um, in these oral histories, um, that there's, there's a few things that are similar in terms of the type of food that people are eating. And then there are some big differences. Um, so that's Ramadan in a nutshell. And the other thing is that Ramadan moves throughout the calendar year. So, you know, an interesting thing about, especially for those people that teach around holidays, which by the way, it seems like in most um, states, there's some lessons that require, that, that um, where teachers are required to teach on holidays. And oftentimes that falls on Christmas. But the thing about um, the Muslim holidays is that they move throughout the solar year. So this year it's in the summer, but in another 15 years, it'll be, um, you know, closer to winter. So it moves throughout the years. Um, and, you know, oftentimes people might be teaching about this during Christmas when they're doing their holiday lessons. Um, and that's often in the early elementary years. So with that, moving on, um, I think we, Oh, so, you know, there are many resources where if you wanted to teach about Ramadan, we would encourage you to go perhaps elsewhere. And I think we'll share some links with you on the New York City Board of Ed has put together an excellent curriculum on teaching about Ramadan. But what we're doing here is we are trying to um, understand people's lived experiences of this tradition. And so with that, I think we can turn to um, to the oral history. Um, hold on just a second. So, uh, okay. Sonnet? No, no, I, yeah, no, that was great. I was going to ask Alex. So, this, this is one of the links, but now we're going to play the oral history. Perfect. And um, Alex, are we going to have the um, transcript? The transcript as well. The Right the there. transcript will um, play here. Um, it will highlight the words uh, for accessibility purposes. Okay, and um, just to situate and prepare you, um, so Stacy Salima Bell is one of the oral um, is, is one of the people who has been was interviewed as part of this project, and we took um, we identified clips from the collection where people are speaking specifically about Ramadan and where we have something to learn about Ramadan and Eid through their clip. And so she's not, she's, um, she is describing her experience as a Girl Scout um, troop leader. And I think with that, we would encourage you to listen and to read to, um, and just, um, yeah, it's kind of an open listening um, exercise. And this is going to be three minutes long. We did scouts on Friday evenings, lots of fun things. The one thing that I loved about, not the one thing, there were so many things, but one of the major things that I loved about doing scouts there is I got, I brought some of the African-American girls, we had Pakistani girls, we had Arab girls, we had African girls. And the one thing that's great about this country, when Muslims converge, is you start to see what's cultural and what's Islamic. When those girls sat in a circle and I asked them one question, what do you eat when you break fast during Ramadan? Do you eat something traditional? So the West African girls were like, yes, they were clearly things that were the same. And we knew that those things were the Islamic things. So when someone says, I break my fast with dates, with water, that's something traditional that the Prophet Muhammad did. But then when we start diverging, but for my iftar or for my meal, what I have is I have rice and beans that came from the girl who was Puerto Rican. I have platanos maduro that was from the girl who was, who was Puerto Rican. From the black girls, well, my mother made mac and cheese. She fried chicken. Or she had baked, you know, roasted baked chicken. We had greens. And then some of the other girl, well, that's not Muslim. And I would say, who says? Clearly it's Muslim. We eat different foods. We're supposed to have our culture. And it's something else that the, the Prophet Muhammad 
said to the Ummah, so Islamic is breaking it with the dates and the water. Everything else that we did was not necessarily Islamic. It was your culture. And what happens there is the girls start to get insight, like they understand why they're doing things, and then they can decide for themselves what they will keep and what they will get rid of. But clearly, it's nothing wrong with keeping those cultural traditions, but don't pass it off as Islam. And now they know that it's not. We even discussed the fact that I would take them to different masajid or different mosques around the city. And when we go to mine, Khalifa, it was open, there was no division. And the girls were like, wow. But yet, it was hard, we were hard pressed to find a Pakistani mosque that we can go to because those women did not go pray outside of the house. So they had to sit and I wanted them to use the Quran, use it, go back to the book and you tell me where it says that this is good or this is not. So hearing different traditions educates them and you become American Muslim. You begin to establish an American Islamic identity. Okay. Um, if one of the suggestions that we have in listening to this as um, in a class is that before listening to it, we didn't do this today, was we have students um, kind of do a, um, uh, do we have, can we pull up the, uh, the, the chart, Alex? Um, sort of a graphic organizer where they, where they It's in the, the chat box. Oh, it's in the chat box. Okay. Um, you know, what do you know about Eid and Ramadan before we listen to the clip? And we didn't do that today. I just kind of talked about it. And so after listening, um, well, while listening, you could be, um, they could be jotting notes about what they heard. Um, and I would just, I guess in the, in the chat um, area, um, I would like for you all to just kind of type type something, write something that stood out to you in listening to Stacey Salima Bell, rather than all, you know, talking about it. Let's do this on chat. What was something that stood out to you from listening to this clip? So everyone had different ways of honoring the same tradition, says Nathan. There's an intersection of culture and practice, you know, culture, which might be the type of foods. Um, hi, Paul from Vermont. Yeah, I mean, there's this question about what becomes culture and what becomes religion. This idea that, you know, in a space like Girl Scouts, Janice is saying that, you know, who says it's not Muslim, it's American Muslim identity. This is what Stacey Salima Bell was, her, her words, um, that in the space where different people come together, you're forging something that's distinctly American. Um, great. Um, is there anything, so in, in also in the graphic organizer room, so is there something, well, anybody else want to make a comment about what they heard out loud? You can unmute yourself. I, I have to say, you know, because I've been on the conference all day, just a good reminder that cultural education doesn't just happen in formal schools. Yeah. And <clears throat> this was, I think, just a good reminder that the, these after school spaces like Scouts are really, really rich opportunities for, for students to learn um, in different ways. So just, you know, we've been talking more about sort of going untraditional in terms of building community and uh, 
seems to me that, you know, thinking about Girl Scout troop leaders is a, is a really important, or other kinds of after school youth leaders is a really important aspect of our teaching and learning community. And I also want to say, you know, to underline the significance of using oral history um, is that when when there is a textbook that's describing Ramadan, there's this tendency to kind of essentialize this is what Muslims do without kind of um, pointing to the diversity within traditions. And I think, you know, because oral history, it's, it's personal um, and it's, it's drawing from the human experience, I think that there is some more authenticity that, that you get as compared to that textbook set of definitions that everybody is trying to put these, these um, holidays, these practices and cultures into a box. And we know that, um, that that's not life. And from that standpoint, I think that this is where the oral history becomes a valuable um, educational tool. And I just wanna back up one minute for those, because we did a session last time about the difference between the transcripts. So we do provide the written transcripts and we do provide the transcription as you're listening, but there's the importance of hearing the timber of Stacy Salima's, Salima Bell's voice, her hesitations. There's moments in her voice where you hear some emotion coming through is a really, really important part of the process of listening. Okay, with that, let's move on. We have, I think Alex is going to, um, we're gonna do one more oral history um, where we listen to a slightly different perspective on Ramadan. Yes, um, we ready? So here we're thinking about, um, continue to think about that diversity of experience. Tell me a little about um, when you came to the U.S. and you were starting your own family, how practicing your religion changed. When I came, I told you there is no Muslim around me. Uh, there is a, it's, I'm living in a Christian country. It's, I was feeling the religion, as you see, celebrating the Christmas, the Easter with my kids, okay? Uh, all occasions, uh, 4th of July, Le Memoria, if all occasions, I feel it, uh, the need I need and my kids need. My life it changed. In 1987, my whole family came. And when my whole family came and we united, now the religion became uh, it's, uh, present in our life. Uh, first, we, st uh, we start with the kids, they start fasting. You're talking about 1987, the oldest one, she was seven. Uh, we start fasting, you can say, at uh, 89. 89 or 90. In 89, she was nine years old. They want to fast because they saw my family fasting and they have the attention like every day one invite us for a, for a futur, for a breakfast, for we call it a breakfast, okay? And we every week we make big, big one for the whole family. You know, it was amazing. Plus our friends and my friends, not my family, my friends too, when they find out, like because I'm not wearing scarf, I'm not, uh, doesn't show I'm religious, they are so proud that I I make my kids fast. It's not I make them or I force them, they wanna fast. And my kids was fasting and they go to Catholic school and the principal of the Catholic school, she congratulated them and she was so proud of them. This is a big, a big impact in my kids. Like they felt there is no difference between Christianity and Muslim. And half of their friends until now, they are a Christian and they celebrate with them a Christmas. Like they buy them gift and they, they, for each other. And we start celebrating uh, Ramadan, celebrating the holiday. How? Like we, all the Muslim women, uh, like through the association, we used to do bari for them. And then we start taking our kids to McDonald's, to Coney Island rides. And then we take them to the one uh, near Bay Parkway. I don't know if you know it, there is near, uh, there is one in uh, Bay Parkway too. It's small like uh, rides. 
for the kids. We take them there. Uh, all of us, we take all our kids, we buy them ticket. It was empty, nobody there, like it's full of our kids. And every year we take them to mostly to Coney Island to have rides or, or we take them to movies and then we go to restaurant to have dinner. It became bigger, like it start all the sister with the kids, with the husband, all of us, we go have uh, dinner which it, or lunch. Uh, this is we how we start celebrating and uh, but uh, we like we we are not conf conservative like you know we do what we have to do but we don't go extra <laughs> I love that last line Abiba Unmute. Okay. Um, so two different clips where people are talking about Ramadan. Um, in the chat box, type what what do you think are some similarities and some differences between um, Zainab Bader's experience and um, Stacy Salima Bell's experience? Zainab is a migrant. Um, speak Arabic speaking, and um, Stacey Salima Bell is a African-American, um, migrated to Brooklyn from South Carolina. Um, so let's um, take a minute to compare and contrast. Um, this is something that could be done in a classroom with a Venn diagram, but we're just asking you to do a quick comparison. And also thinking about this idea of American, you know, because they're both talking about this question about America. I mean, we have, you know, getting back to this idea of the migrant versus the um, native born Muslim, is, you know, the, again, the, the bodily experience and the practice and the ritual will be the same. Um, obviously the food will be different. Um, but Zainab is, what's interesting is that she is, uh, describing that there is a change in coming to America. And for her, the change was actually um, getting into her religion. Um, it wasn't necessarily a move away from it, but there was something about um, this diverse, being able to experience the difference and celebrating that difference in, um, and that's, that's also something that came out of being in America. So I think there's a lot of, interesting conversations that you can have with students um, by putting these two side by side, um, the migrant experience and the Native American um, experience and how there are distinctly American things like the coalescing of different foods could be one thing, but also that, that being the minority does not, oh, it, you know, you're, a person is put into a situation where they can either sort of not celebrate or observe, or they might end up being more observant. Now, Zainab found herself somewhere in the middle, but it forced her to confront her own religious practice. Um, Alex, I'm gonna transition to you so that you can talk about um, a little bit more about how these clips can be used in the classroom. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit now about the website as a whole and specifically its use in classrooms. So we designed this curriculum as Sonnet mentioned in the beginning to be implemented in a broad 
sense of ways. And so I think one thing you'll notice about the clips that we shared is that they are they can be used to learn about Eid and Ramadan, but they can be used to learn about any number of themes that you're teaching in your classroom. And I think in terms of that, that's something to say about what the content is of this website, but in terms thematically, I, I think what we're looking at here is both close listening and close reading. And so just to expand a little bit on close listening, we've, we've talked a little bit about oral history, and I want to emphasize the value of the orality here, the value of listening to people's voices in their own words describe themselves and their experiences and how powerful that can be versus reading. Um, but we know that um, just as it's important to do close listening, it's an important to do close reading. And so one of the things that we've done on the website is that, and I link these kind of late here, are provide transcripts. Um, so these, the attention would be, um, if you're teaching with these, you can download them, print them out, and have students have access to the transcripts so that they can read along while listening. And so how do you bring all this home? What do you do kind of at the end of the lesson? Um, here, and for all of the lessons, we've, we've encouraged students to make blackout poetry. Um, so blackout poetry, uh, many of you may be familiar with it, where you take a block of text and you block out all but a couple of words. And so here I've created my own blackout poem um, using Stacy Salima Bell's clip, American Islamic Identity. And you take a second to see what I've uh, written here. Well, I can perform it. No, you should read it. <laughs> perform it, Alex. Oh, well, if the audience demands it. So I put African-American girls, Pakistani girls, Arab girls, African girls. When Muslims converge, you see what's cultural and what's Islamic. There were clearly things that were the same, the Islamic things. When we start diverging, well, that's not Muslim. Who says? Get insight. Understand why they're doing things decide for themselves. Open, no division. The girls find different traditions and become American Muslim, establish an American Islamic identity. Fiend. I remember expecting snaps, but everyone's muted. <laughs> um, so, we love the blackout poetry as a kind of way that blends both artistic learning and a way to bring their own meaning and another layer of meaning to the oral histories and the transcripts. Um, I'd imagine each of us would have created a different um, blackout poem and would have derived a slightly different meaning. I cut out all the stuff with food, um, but I could see a totally another uh, poem that focused just on food. Um, this is a cool website, which we'll share with you that you can uh, make your own. If I hit reset, there it goes. And click on the words. Okay. And so this is how we bring it home. Um, I think, yeah, thank you, Janice. Um, uh, we've provided in our Google Drive here, which I will put in the chat now. Um, a link to the PDFs of the lesson plans and the list of this websites that we've used. This, uh, and for that, I've also provided a text only, pardon me, <coughs> that you can paste into the um, blackout poetry generator and generate your own blackout poem. So I'd like to share just a little bit more about the rest of the website and the features of the website. Um, here are the rest of our lesson plans. You'll notice this website is still under construction. So there's a, a lesson that's supposed to be here, but it's not popping up. There it is. Um, our lessons are grouped thematically um, around themes that we think are somewhat universal, uh, growing up and fitting in, migrating or moving, um, neighborhoods for younger students, and this feeling that um, the relationship between political things and personal things um, in our after 9-11, the political is personal lesson. 
So these are lessons um, that you can take, scavenge, implement directly into your K through 12 plus classroom. Additionally, we've made the clips available. So if you're just looking for a thematic oral history clip to implement um, or an add or supplement to your classroom, you can see um, that we have about 37 clips on our website here, and you can sort them here. This is an alphabetical list. You can also find them by narrator. Here are the narratives that we featured, and you can click on any one narrator to find the clips that we've included in the curriculum. Alex, I just want to add that one of the really brilliant things that Alex and Habiba did in constructing these materials was really listen deeply to all of the 50 plus oral histories, the long ones, and find key clips from those, key bits of, of sound, of text, of language that really would, re they felt would resonate for um, you know, people of all ages. We're not trying to replace the long form oral history, but it does give you a little bit of a teaser, if you will, to sort of think about ideas in different ways and to um, get people curious about the longer oral histories that are there. But I, I just have to give a shout out to Habiba in particular and to Alex for their skill in finding amazingly um, wonderful snips from these longer oral histories that are engaging, that are inspirational, that provoke curiosity, and of course, as we're talking, you know, encourage conversation and reflection and thinking about ways that these words, that these stories make connections to somebody else's life. Thank you, Sonic. Yeah, uh, it was all Habiba. All oh. credit to Habiba for <laughs> identifying the clips um, and making these, these little bite-sized pieces that we hope serve as um, inspiration. Um, you know, they're edited together. We tried to, we preserve the meaning of the oral histories. Um, and I, we hope that if, if this is something that really moves you, you're, you're interested to go into the, and listen to the entire oral history. There are a couple more features of the website um, that I'd like to share. Um, a timeline here in which we, we attempt to do a selected chronology of a history of Muslims in Brooklyn. Um, we'll be adding some details to this, including the uh, deed of the first Muslim to purchase property in what was uh, what will become to be known as Brooklyn um, in the 1600s. And uh, part of the Muslims in Brooklyn project that was really important was that these oral histories are all tied to place. Brooklyn Historical Society is a local historical society. We are intimately connected with our place of where we are. And so we've taken the oral histories and created these story maps that, uh, oh, here we go. My stuff's all in the way, that bring you through Brooklyn. And so you you can, this is just another way in, it helps people get a little bit accompany, uh, accustomed to the geography of Brooklyn and allows you to to listen and scroll around. It's, it's really fun. I, like, I love this part. And finally, um, we have curated that this page is under construction. Um, we understand that, um, you know, our lessons and our, our, the whole framing of the project is deliberately um, not about teaching about the history of Islam itself um, or about the, the um, history explicitly. And so we've prepared a series of essays that deal more in depth with the theoretical and historical concepts that underline uh, a lot of the oral histories. And so we know for teachers, it's important to kind of feel confident to know what you're teaching before you begin teaching it. And on this page, you can find resources to support your own learning or share it with students and support their learning to learn a little bit more about um, to get a little bit more context to the implementation of the oral histories and the lessons. Wonderful. 
Well, we are right on time because we have left the last bit of our session to share questions and comments with anyone. Unless Sana or Habiba has um, other final thoughts to add. Um, we're, we're hoping that this website will go live, as I said, um, right at as June, the beginning of June. Um, on here are materials, there's curriculum guides. Um, as Alex said, those resources were really meant to provide uh, information for teachers, but could also be useful for high school students um, and or for college students to use as background information. Um, in our uh, curriculum guide, we give some tips also about just using oral histories in general. Um, I mentioned that the Brooklyn Historical Society has one of the premier collections of oral histories um, in the country, both in terms of its diversity and in terms of the ways that we provide access to the general public. Um, so I, I encourage you to look on the teacher toolbox and use look at those materials. Um, we were incredibly lucky. Um, it didn't just happen um, to have an amazing photographer uh, who helped us with uh, finding uh, different kinds of images throughout the borough. Um, and I hope that you'll see in some of these images the reinforcement of one of our goals, which was to make sure that people understand that Muslims are indeed an incredibly diverse group of people um, and reflect tremendous amount of different ways of looking at life, different ways of experiencing the world um, and live in very different neighborhoods and um, live different lives. So all of that's, uh, I think, an important part. Um, I also want to say you heard a little bit um, in one of, or two, one of the clips from our interviewer. So we're also trying to help people understand the process of oral histories themselves and that oral histories are a process by which a narrator is willing to tell their story um, and an interviewer will help to shape and go deeper into some of the areas. So again, while this is very much about Muslims in Brooklyn, um, at the same time, it is also an incredible primer on different ways to think about oral history as a resource for teaching in a classroom. Questions? Or comments or thoughts or suggestions? We're, we're still at the point where we can maybe squeak in a few changes with our web designer. I want to add that my favorite collection is the one called Growing Up and Fitting In. And, you know, we've made all these lessons, we've organized them into things that can align with curriculum and standards, but I think it's, it's um, really fun just to go through and to listen. Um, and there's some real gems that, you know, you can't write this stuff sometimes. Like this is real life. And sometimes like the, the labor of going through an entire oral history is a lot and it's what historians do. But the fact that these are chunked into small bite-sized pieces that I think we really thought about the child, like teen or secondary school listener. So they've been broken up. And so, you know, they're, they're very accessible. So I encourage you to just go and listen to some of them. Um, some of them are very dramatic. Um, it's not like a podcast, but they're just short and, and, and fun. So I to say, like, I've been just poking around and looking at some of the lessons and I just, I love them. I love the organization and how they're laid out. Uh, it like makes a lot of sense to me. The graphic organizers are just really inviting and it really chunks that learning experience and moment and helps us work through a material that, I mean, I've worked with a lot of oral histories and it's overwhelming really quickly. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's, I can't put a fine enough point on how important it is to be able to find pathways into the, these words and pathways that aren't reductionist, but in fact, 
kind of helping you connect it to other experiences, to other words, to your own uh, kinds of ways of interacting with those words. And so I really love how these lessons are just so smart about that. And I will also add, because I don't think we actually showed it, but each of the lessons, in addition to thinking about the ways of using blackout poetry as a way to more deeply listen to and pay attention to the words, each lesson also has other kinds of activities or projects to deepen um, a student's experience with the material and with the content that's real, you know, on, on the material. I wanna um, just quickly say, you know, part of what becomes really interesting at the Historical Society is thinking about how people use these kinds of resources, whether it's an oral history, whether it's a historical document, whether it's a piece of text. And one of the great things about the Historical Society has been its ongoing commitment to work um, increasingly with artists who use archives and materials and think about ways that those um, uh, sort of historical resources become a palette for an artist to make an installation. And sadly, with the, the closure of the building because of COVID, uh, people can't see an amazing immersive installation created by Camila Janan Rashid, where she also listened to these oral histories. Um, and she took clips also and installed works of art around this small room um, that were then responsive to an iPod. I'm trying to do this, Alex, you could probably describe it better than me. But you walk through a room and your iPod picks up these oral history clips. So it's like you're in a, in a cafe where a conversation is happening. Again, it's not meant to say this is, you know, indicative and teaching you about Muslims in Brooklyn. This is snippets of conversation that get you interested and excited. So I, I want to sort of shout out to that sort of the importance of different ways that people can use these materials um, to be creative. And the Blackout Poem is one, but there's some other examples in our lesson plans.